Good morning, fellowship. But I already know what you're thinking. All right. Blake is going to be really long-winded today if he needs an entire pitcher of water for his sermon. Okay, I know. I'm going to get in front of it. But calm down. It's just an illustration, all right? I need this water because I have a question for you this morning, fellowship. I have a question. It is an age-old question. I'm sure you've heard this question asked before in different ways. My question for you is this. Is this glass of water half empty or is it half full? What do you think? What do you think? Is this, when you look at this glass of water, do you think of it as being the glass half empty or do you think of it as being the glass half full? Now, whichever one you answer, if you say half empty or half full, we can all agree that your answer depends, right? The answer depends on where you put your focus. So if you, if you focus up here on the empty part, of the glass, you're likely to say the glass is half empty. But if you put your focus down here on the filled part, you're likely to say the glass is half full. So your answer depends on where you put your focus. So my real question for you this morning, fellowship, is where do you put your focus? Now, I'm not asking where you focus on a silly cup of water, okay? I'm not a shrink. I'm not going to psychoanalyze this morning. I'm asking where do you put your focus in your life? All right. In your day-to-day life, would you say that you tend to focus more on the things that you have, the things that you've received, the things that you've been blessed with by God, or would you say you tend to focus up here on the things that you don't have, the things that you're missing or you perceive to be missing, where you have unmet desires and unmet expectations? Where do you put your focus? Reflect for a second, think about it, and be honest with yourself. Be honest, because if, if I'm being honest with myself, I know that I can tend to focus up here on all the things that I think are missing in my life. And I'm willing to bet that many of you are right there with me. I think it's actually, it's a safe bet because I know the way that our world works. All right? I know that much in our society is drawing our attention, putting our focus on all the things that we don't have. So just, just one example that I have is advertising. Have you ever thought about what advertising is? Advertising seeks to grab your attention, put it on a product that you don't have, and make you believe that your life would be better if only you had that thing. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. If only you had that thing. If only you had those new pair of shoes. If only you had that new car. For me right now, it's if only I had that new maple pepper bacon sandwich from Chick-fil-A. You know, life, life would be okay, all right? But say, I I read an article this week in the Harvard Business Review. It was titled, Advertising Makes You Unhappy. And this article discussed this massive study that was done with data from, collected from over 30 years with 20 some odd countries involved. And they showed a direct correlation that when a country spends more on advertising in a year, its citizens report less life satisfaction. Why? Well, they conclude that advertising makes us unhappy. Exposing people to lots of advertising makes them feel that their own lives, their own experiences, their own possessions are inadequate, i.e. it's drawing our attention up here, putting it on the things that we don't have. And it's scary when you think about it because people estimate that in cities like Dallas that we are exposed to anywhere from 50 to 400 ads per day. This is crazy. No wonder we tend to focus up here. And, you know, the matter only gets worse when you think about social media and how we're constantly comparing ourselves to one another, or don't get me started on the news and just the negativity that that puts our minds on. So what are we to do, fellowship? What are we to do? What can we do when so much in our society is drawing our focus and putting it on all the things that we don't have, leaving us feeling dissatisfied? Well, praise God for his word. Praise God for the book of Psalms and praise God especially for Psalm 136 as I believe it has exactly what we need. Psalm 136, as we're going to see today, by design, forces our focus off of what we don't have and it puts it on what God has done for us. Okay, and so as we shift our focus through reading Psalm 136, the psalm is also going to call us to do something this morning. Okay, the psalm is going to call us to publicly declare... God is worthy of all worship for his unending loyal love. So if you haven't already, go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to Psalm 136, okay? We're going to be in Psalm 136 this morning. 
And, you know, this past semester, I was actually privileged enough to take a Psalms class at DTS. And my professor, Dr. Ron Allen, he would emphasize to us over and over, it's so important to remember, when you're reading the book of Psalms, that you are reading a book of poetry, okay? It is intended to be read as poetry. And as you guys know, poetry is intended to be experienced. It's intended to be felt. Think, think of your favorite song when it comes on and the feelings you get when you hear that song. It's the same with the Psalms. There's an experience to be had here. And it would, it would be a mistake to look just for a message in the Psalms, but to miss the experience in the process. And Psalm 136 is a perfect example of this because as we're going to see, it's going to get really repetitive. 26 times the psalm is going to have us repeat, his love endures forever. His love endures forever. Now, why would it do this? Why would it repeat it so many times? If, it, if it's just a message, if it's just making a point, it could have said his love endures forever once, maybe three times if you want to emphasize it. But 26 times the psalmist has us repeat it over and over to experience it, to feel it, to allow that fact that God's love endures forever, to allow it to sink itself into our hearts until we actually feel it and believe it. This is the experience. This repetition is exactly what's going to force our focus off of what we lack and put it onto God's love that endures forever. And it's going to do this through five movements in the Psalms, okay? We're going to have five movements. The first movement is going to be an opening call to give God thanks, followed by three places where we see God display his love that endures forever. And then we'll close with a final call to give God thanks. So let's walk through it together. Psalm 136. The first three verses are going to give us the opening call to give thanks to God. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of the lords. His love endures forever. So these first three verses right off the bat tells us exactly who the psalm is talking about. We are talking about the Lord We're talking about Yahweh, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and he is good. And we are to give thanks to our good God for his love that endures forever. So it seems pretty straightforward, right? But actually, there's a couple of words here right off the bat that we need to clarify before we move forward. Okay, so there's, we're going to learn two Hebrew words this morning that we've really got to, to hone in on if we're going to unlock what Psalm 136 means. Okay, ready to learn Hebrew? All right, so the first word that we need to clarify here is the word translated as love. And the Hebrew word here is, Noah said it earlier, it's kesed, okay, kesed. I had COVID last week and I could say it perfectly with the the kesed, you know? And so kesed, depending on your Bible version, it's translated a number of ways. So my Bible says love. Your Bible might say steadfast love, faithful love. If you're a King James person, it says mercy, Uh, Some Bibles say loving kindness, which is this compound word that we had to make up trying to explain what kesed means. So what is kesed with all these different translations? Well, kesed, to put it simply, is, is God's covenantal love towards his people. The best way I hear it put in the Net Bible is it is his loyal love, okay? It's God's loyal love, that, loyal love that we see God display towards his people Israel all throughout the Old Testament, despite them being unfaithful despite their flaws. Because the deal with kesed is it's not, a, it's not a love that depends on the other person. This isn't a, I will love you if you do this. It's not a, I love you if you are good. This is, I love you because I have promised to. It is in God's character to love, to faithfully, loyally love his people. It's just who he is. So that's kesed. It's loyal love. Now the second word we need to clarify here is the word thanks. So the Hebrew word being translated is the word yada. Yada. Say that. Yada. It's like tada, but with a Y. Yada. All right. Yada. Now the deal with yada is yada doesn't really mean thanks. There's actually no word in biblical Hebrew for thanks or thank you. But yada typically gets translated as thanks or thank you, but it it more literally means to publicly acknowledge, to publicly declare, to tell somebody about your gratitude towards God. So in Old Testament times, one didn't give thanks to God just by going and saying, 
thank you, God. They gave thanks by going and telling somebody about what God had done for them. Now, you've, you've probably done this in your own way at some point. Think of a time, think of a time when you've been praying for something, really, really praying, and then God answered your prayer, right? Maybe you were praying, you had a, a health scare or something, or, or you, you were looking for a new job, okay? And then God answered your prayer, and you were so, so thankful. Now, that thankfulness is one thing, but then the thankfulness becomes yada when you go and tell somebody else about it. So when you, when you break the news to your family that you've got a full bill of health, that God has answered their prayers, that's yada. Okay, or when you post on social media and you say, God has provided me with a new job, praise the Lord, that is yada. Yada is telling people about what God has done. It gets, us, it gets us out of just being thankful in our heart and gets us talking about what God has done and spreading his fame. And that is what the Psalms means when it says to give thanks. So Kesed and Yada, right off the bat, Psalm is telling us we are to publicly declare God's unending loyal love. Now, verses four through nine is going to give us the first example of God's love on display. It says, to him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. So in these verses, we're going to see that God displays his unending loyal love through his great wonders of creation. We see his unending loyal love through his great wonders of creation. Now, as, as we read that, you might have noticed there's a Genesis 1 theme going on in these verses. It says, it says, God alone does these great wonders. He made the heavens. He made the earth. He made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. Yeah, they, he's copying Genesis 1 here, and it, I'm immediately reminded of what else Genesis 1 says about all of this creation. It says that, that all of this creation, everything in the universe, everything that we can see here on the earth was made by our God, and it is good. That is, through God's creation, we get to see a glimpse of God. We get to see a glimpse of God's goodness, His love, and His glory on display in creation. Romans 1.20 puts it this way. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And the psalmist is saying the same thing. The psalmist is saying, just look around you. Focus. Focus on what you see around you in creation and see God is worthy of all worship for his unending love. Now, a few weeks ago, I got to uh, get out of Dallas. Now, I, I say that like I'm serving a prison sentence here, but it, it feels that way sometimes. I got to get out of Dallas, and I got to go to Montana for a week to Glacier National Park. Oh, my gosh. All right. it, it is the most beautiful place that I have ever seen. Okay, And got to spend a few days in the park just hiking, uh, uh, driving around, taking in the views. Just absolutely beautiful. Now, have you ever been out in nature and had one of those moments where you're just stunned by what you're seeing, stunned by God's beauty and glory and creation? Well, in Glacier, I was having one of those moments about every half hour, okay? It was, it was amazing. And I was having one of these moments, and as it was happening, I stood and I was looking at, at a picture that we're about to see. I was looking at this exact location at this lake, and I was, as you can tell, I was in my feels, you know, I was, I was speechless, I was teary-eyed. And I had started studying for this sermon, and I thought of this psalm, and I was, I was just struck with the realization, it might sound simple, but I was struck thinking that, you know, I'm not just looking at a lake, I'm not just looking at some mountains, I am getting to gaze upon the handiwork of our majestic creator, God, that I get to see his creation, and it is shouting that God is worthy of all worship. Now, one of the things that I, I love about Courtney is that anytime that we're out in nature, 
Uh, when we see something beautiful, whether we see something like that, or if we're just on a walk in Dallas and we see a sunset, every time Courtney will stop, she'll turn to that sunset, she'll point, and she'll say, hey, God made that. And I love that. She does it every time without fail. And she doesn't realize it, but in that moment, she is yadahing. She is publicly declaring the goodness and the love in God's creation that she sees. And the psalmist is calling each and every one of us to do the exact same, but we have to notice it first. We've got to focus on all the creation that is around us. It was George Washington Carver who said, I love to think of nature as unlimited broadcasting stations through which God speaks to us every day, every hour, and every moment of our lives if we will only tune in and remain so. So fellowship question is, are you tuned in? Are you focused on all the creation that's around you that is screaming of God's loyal love? Have you, have you noticed it lately? You don't have to go to Montana for it, although I recommend you do. It's loud and clear there. But it's also here. It's everywhere. It's all around you all the time. All of creation is screaming, God is worthy of all worship. So take some time today. Take some time this week. Go notice God's love in his creation. Be thankful for it, but don't stop there, okay? Yada. Point at it and tell somebody, hey, God made that. Now, Verses 10 through 16 gives us the second display of God's love. It says, To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever, and brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever, but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea, His love endures forever to him who led his people through the wilderness. His love endures forever. Now, in this section, we've got an Exodus theme going on, okay? He is recounting the Exodus, the ultimate redemption story from the Old Testament, the story where God comes to Israel's rescue and redeems them from slavery in Egypt. And I, I love that the psalmist doesn't say a word about Moses, about Aaron, about Joshua, Miriam, any of the people that you typically think of in the Exodus. He is putting all of his focus, all of attention on God, who alone is the redeemer in the story. I love that. And he's telling us over and over and over why God did this. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. See, God didn't redeem Israel because they were good and faithful people. If you've ever read the Exodus, you know that Israel, they were not good and faithful people, right? God did this because of his kesed, because of his loyal love, his faithful promise to love his people Israel forever, no matter what. Now this this psalm, Psalm 136, it's known as the great Hillel song. And it's intended to be sung every year during the Jewish Passover ceremony. It's supposed to serve as a reminder of Israel's redemption out of Egypt. And I think one of the coolest things that they do during the Passover ceremony is when they eat the meal, they eat these these bitter herbs. Okay, these bitter herbs that serves as a reminder of the bitterness of the life of slavery in Egypt before God redeemed them. I think that's so cool. Like I, I wish the church had something like that. I was thinking about it. I guess we do have bitter church coffee, you know, but I'm not, I'm not so sure that counts. I'm not sure if it does the same thing, but I wish we had a reminder that would remind us of the bitterness of the life of sin that we lived before God redeemed us. Because in my experience, the people that remember the most what God has done for them, their life of sin, those are the people that redeem, that, that yadah the loudest. And I've got a buddy like this. His name's, his name's Chadrick. He's a uh, He's my age, but he was saved just a few years ago. And his, he's got one of those testimonies of before coming to Christ, I mean, it was drinking, drugs, gang activity, everything. It was a dark path. But then he met Jesus, and Jesus transformed his life. And now you cannot get Chadrick to stop talking about Jesus. He yadahs nonstop. He's, he's one of those guys, you know what I mean? Like one of those Christians. Like he will go out onto the street corner and preach to people as they pass by. Like that is Yadah. 
He's gone around to retirement homes here in Dallas asking if he can come in and just lead a devotion for the people there. That is Yada. He has printed his testimony. He's put Bible verses and messages on flyers, printed them out, and put them on people's windshields. That is Yada. He's, uh, he's engaged now, and he actually met his fiance by going up to her on the street and sharing the gospel with her. So if you're single, a little more motivation to Yada. You know what I mean? But he, the deal with Chadwick is he's... He's not some Bible scholar. He's not a trained preacher. He's just a guy that knows what God has done for him, has redeemed him, and he wants to tell everyone he can about that. I mean, he, he, he's nothing special. He's, he's never uh, taken a preaching class or anything like that. He just tells everybody about what God has done, and we can do the same. We don't have to have a grandiose testimony of, of drinking and drugs or anything like that. We just have to understand that each and every one of us, we were slaves to sin before God redeemed us. Now see, the original intent of this psalm was to focus Israel's hearts on the redemption that they had received in the Exodus story. But I believe that we have an even greater redemption story in the gospel. So in, the, in the Exodus, God redeems one nation, the people of Israel, but in the gospel, God is redeeming people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. In the, in the Exodus, God saves his people from slavery to Egypt. But in the gospel, you and I have been saved from slavery to sin and to death. And in the Exodus, God sends 10 plagues to rescue his people. But in the gospel, God has sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be our redeemer. And fellowship, in our redemption that we have received from Jesus Christ, we have received the greatest gift of kesed, of unending loyal love the world has ever seen. And it is to the extent that we focus on that, to the extent that we focus on that kesed that we've received, that is the extent that we will live lives of gratitude, that we will live lives of yada, that we will live lives that scream, God is worthy of all worship. And then the third display of God's love is shown in verses 17 through 25. It says, to him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, his love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our lowest state, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Now, the first section, there was a Genesis theme. The second section, there was an Exodus theme. And here, we have a book of Numbers theme. And personally, I'm just glad the psalmist skipped the book of Leviticus, because I don't know how I would have preached that this morning. But we have the book of Numbers. And if you remember, this is where we see God start to lead the Israelites into the promised land after they've been wandering in the wilderness. And as they go, they encounter your encounter armies and kings like the ones mentioned here, Sihon and Og. And these armies terrify the Israelites. But each time, God provides a victory to his people. And what's so interesting to me about the book of Numbers is that it is filled with so much fear, so much worry, and so much doubt on the part of the Israelites. I mean, these, these people had seen God do miracle after miracle, mighty work after mighty work to redeem them out of Egypt. But at every drop of the hat, they would start to fear and doubt that God would continue to provide for them. I mean, they were, they were afraid they would starve in the wilderness. They were afraid that they would go thirsty. They were afraid of these kings and armies. But God would over and over provide. He gave them manna for food. He gave them water from a rock. And he delivered these kings and armies into their hands. But see, they, were, they weren't focused. They weren't focused on what God had done for them. They were focused on what they didn't have in the wilderness. And, and as they lost their focus on God, they started to breed fear and worry and doubt. Now, it's the question, can you imagine being that silly? Can you imagine 
forgetting what God has done for you and starting to worry and to doubt that God would provide and care for you. Can you imagine that? I can. I don't have to work too hard because I do this every single day. Okay, I, I, lose, I lose my focus on what God has done for me and I worry and I doubt that he will do this. And don't we all, aren't we just like the Israelites? Don't we all constantly doubt what God will do and provide for us? And it really is so crazy when you think about it. I mean, it was, it was crazy for the Israelites to see God do all of these things to rescue them and then just think that he would leave them to die in the wilderness. I mean, if he was going to do all of those things to save them out of Egypt, of course he's going to provide for them. So how much crazier is it for us when we consider what God has done for us through his son, Jesus, that he won't also still provide for us in everything that we need? Romans 8.32, it's a verse that we all love it, but I'm not so sure we actually believe it. It says, he who did not spare his own son gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And do you believe that, fellowship? Do you actually believe that if God loves you enough to send you his son to die for you, how will he not also give you all things? How will he not also give you all things? And and he'll do this not because we deserve it, but because of his kessed, because of his loyal love to us, because he's promised to love his people. And verse 25 doubles down on this. It says, he gives food to every creature. And then Jesus then echoes this later in the Sermon on the Mount when he tells us not to be anxious. You remember Jesus says, he says, so God has given clothes to the grass and God has given food for the birds. Don't you think he'll also provide for you? And he will. He provides for us, even in our worries, even in our doubts. So so for you, it could be, I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills, but I know God's love endures forever. Like, I don't know how my kids are going to turn out in this crazy world, but I know his love endures forever. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years. I don't know where I'm going to be in five, but I do know God's love endures forever. So once more, I have to ask fellowship, where where is your focus? Is Is it here on everything God has done for you, the promises he's made for you? Because I I know we all have our worries, I know we all have our fears, I know we all have our doubts, but I also know that when you put your focus here, when you focus on what God has done, on the redemption that we have received, and the promise that he's made to graciously provide for all things, when you focus on that, your worries and your doubts and your fears will melt away. And then we come to our last verse, verse 26. It's the closing call of thanks. It says, give thanks to the God of heaven His love endures forever. Now, this is the only place in the entire book of Psalms that God is called the God of heaven. And it's just reiterating that God is sovereign over all. He is the God of creation, the God of our redemption, and the God of provision. And the psalmist, once more, calls us to give him thanks, or remember, to yadah, to publicly acknowledge him. Now, my Psalms professor, Dr. Allen, that I told you about, he tells a story about a time he was teaching about this subject in a church. He was teaching that yada means to publicly declare and that there's no Hebrew word for thank you. He tells the story and he says, uh, after he got done teaching, uh, a man came up to him and introduced himself. He was an ophthalmologist who had been a medical missionary in India. And this guy's uh, uh, mission had been in a region of India where Uh, where progressive blindness was endemic, where thousands of people were born with their sight, but as they got older, they were doomed to go blind. So this man's mission was to set up a clinic and provide a procedure that would save them and arrest this eye disease, which he did with much success. And then this guy goes on to tell Dr. Allen, he said, when people from the region would come to my clinic and they would receive the procedure that would save their sight when otherwise they would have gone blind, none of them would say thank you because they didn't have a word for it in their dialect, just like the Hebrews. Instead, what they would say is, I will tell of your name. I will tell of your name. I will tell other people what you have done for me. And this is exactly what Psalm 136 is calling us to do, to tell of God's name. A a psalm of thanksgiving is not just about being thankful in your heart. It is being filled with gratefulness, with gratitude for all the love and mercy that God has given you, and then going and declaring it, telling other people about it. And we're actually a lot more like that Indian group than we think. We 
we have a word for thank you, but when somebody does something truly great, we, we tell of their name. And when somebody does something great, we name buildings after them, we name roads after them, we'll make movies after them. So how much more so ought we to be telling of God's name for the amazing love he has shown us in creation and in redemption and in our provision? And can you imagine what it would be like, what our world would be like? Imagine just what your home would be like. Imagine what this church would be like if we were people that was marked, that were marked by, by what God has done for us. If we were constantly focusing on what God has done for us, the love that he's shown, telling of his name rather than people that constantly fixate on what we lack. So to close, and as Noah and Sarah come back out, I want to go back to our, our opening question, okay? Opening question, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Well, I actually think it's a misleading question. See, once we go through the psalm, once we see all that God has done for us in our creation, in our redemption, in our provision, we start to see we have so much more than we ever thought. And once we consider this psalm, once we see that God's love is displayed in creation, once we see that God's love is displayed in our redemption, and once we see God's love displayed in our provision, we realize the glass isn't half empty. The glass isn't half full. The glass is overflowing. We lack absolutely nothing in Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. And it's because God's love endures forever. Amen? And this is what Psalm 136 is calling us to do, to realize, to focus on. And now it's telling us to go and tell somebody about it by publicly declaring God is worthy of all worship for his unending loyal love. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We praise you for being the creator God who has displayed your love and your beauty and your glory everywhere for us to see. God, we praise you maybe most of all for our redemption. We praise you for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, that we were dead in our sins and that you rescued us and redeemed us through your son. And God, we praise you for providing for us. We praise you for loving us and caring for us, not leaving us to die in the wilderness, but to continue to provide for us every single day, giving us all of our needs. God, we love you so much. I pray, I ask that we would focus on this, that we would focus on you, and what you have done. We would focus on your love that endures forever, God. Fix our minds on that. Remind us of it every day, not just today, but every day, that your love truly endures forever. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We could just respond by singing this song that is straight out of this psalm. Could we stand and sing this psalm together? to one another and to our Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good. He is above all things. His love endures forever. So sing praise. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever And sing praise Sing praise Sing praise
forever and by the grace of God we will carry on his love into us forever sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise forever God is faithful that we're about to sing out. love you we praise you forever your steadfast love endures we love you god thank you for this moment of worship that we've had to remind us would it compel us would the word continue to go forth in our hearts father telling us to shout out your praise to yada we love you god again amen you guys are dismissed if you are new here we would love to see you downstairs in next steps in the hub. If you need prayer, our elders will be down front and we have prayer rooms open on the concourse. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.